Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. What you guys didn't just hear is the original take was, welcome to God Damn It. <laughs> God Damn It. I was, got that mixed up with the other podcast. I've been <laughs> I was with. wondering if you were moonlighting on me and I didn't no, know about listen, it. So. <laughs> the other podcast, I'll break it to you now. It's called God Damn It. And it's me <laughs> and a guy even older than me that just sit around talking about things that are happening in the world. And we go, God Damn It. Wait, is it future, Rob? Are you secretly doing a podcast with me from the future? Um, no, because you know what? You just wouldn't be as upset about things. <laughs> future, future Rob is just as mellow as uh, as uh, present Rob is. So anyway, <laughs> that'll be debuting sometime soon um, on all your local podcast networks. Welcome to God Damn It. All right, so uh, the we're at... <laughs> oh man, I couldn't resist taking a shot at my co-host. So. The book we're going to be talking about this episode is The Warehouse by Rob Hart. You heard our, if you listened to our previous episode, you'll know that we spent over an hour talking to him about the book and other stuff, and it was a great, great conversation. Uh, but here's a bio for him, just in case. Rob Hart is the author of five novels and the short story collection Takeout. He lives in Staten Island, New York, with his wife and daughter. I like how you drag that, that synopsis out a little bit. I was trying to pace it a little. <laughs> yeah. Somehow you managed to take those uh, those two sentences and, and, and make it into like two and a half almost. So, Yeah, I'm in a mood. Great bio from Rob. Yeah, I like it. Here is the synopsis in case you've been living under a rock for the last two months or so. Paxton never thought he'd be working for Cloud, the giant tech company that's eaten much of the American economy, much less that he'd be moving into one of the company's sprawling live-work facilities. But compared to what's left outside, Cloud's bland, chain store life of gleaming entertainment halls, open plan offices, and vast warehouses, well, doesn't seem so bad. It's more than anyone else is offering. Zinnia never thought she'd be infiltrating Cloud, but now she's undercover inside the walls, risking it all to ferret out the company's darkest secrets. And Paxton, with his ordinary little hopes and fears, he might just make the perfect pawn, if she can bear to sacrifice him. As the truth about Cloud unfolds, Zinnia must gamble everything on a desperate scheme, one that risks both their lives, even as it forces Paxton to question everything about the world he's so carefully assembled here. Together, they'll learn just how far the company will go to make the world a better place. Set in the confines of a corporate panopticon. Panopticon? Panopticon? Pan Am I saying that right? Panopticon, yeah. Panopticon. panopticon? Yeah. Uh, set in the confines of a corporate panopticon that's at once brilliantly imagined and terrifyingly real, The Warehouse is a near-future thriller about what happens when Big Brother meets Big Business and who will pay the ultimate price. Dun-dun-dun. It does have that kind of stinger of an ending, doesn't it? <laughs> mm, it does. Um, I, I'm, I apologize for making you read that big-ass synopsis. It, wasn't inten it was kind of intentional. Well, I, I don't mind. I just this time I didn't read it, or I would have had that that person tell me how to say Panopticon. The, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, where you look it up and they say it. Panopticon. <laughs> yeah. Panopticon. Like Panopticon. Anthropoph anthropophagites. Anthropophagites. Wow, that's. Do you a... remember? Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's talk about it for, before getting this book. Wonder whatever happened to Malaz. Oh, he's out there somewhere, being Dutch. Are, are we sure? Uh, I, I'm we... assuming. All right, just checking. Malaz, he might he might be listening uh still we should we should uh we should have a where are they now episode <laughs> all the lives all the wreckage we've left in our in our wake <laughs> yeah where we try to track these people down and see what's uh what they're up to i don't know there might be something left to throw and we get some <laughs> empty weeks coming up in december oh my god so stay tuned for that episode that's, that's hor I, i'm horrified at the idea um anyway the warehouse uh so here i'm going to start by saying uh if you want to know um kind of some of the motivations for writing it what the book you know what the message was and stuff like that just jump back to uh the previous episode and listen to our interview with rob hart we do not spoil anything but you get a lot of insight into his thought process and his feelings about things and what inspired him to write the book. So that's a great place to start if you want to understand why the book exists. Uh, in this review, we're probably going to go into more about what the book is and what our impressions of it are. So if you want to know more about the why, just jump back one episode. 
For sure. So instead of getting into it um, the way that, you know, we kind of normally do in a very linear fashion, there are probably some things we should go over from the synopsis. So um, it is the near future, which is mentioned towards the end of the synopsis. Uh, there is a company called Cloud. Uh, they have taken over basically most of, of everything um, retail related. So think like Amazon, but think even bigger. Um, there's an event that occurred that basically drove people um, more towards online stores and, and allowed cloud to um, really become it's like a sales juggernaut where it's it's exactly what you think of Amazon, only so much bigger than than the reality of what you think. So we all think like, oh, Amazon's so big, Amazon this and that. But you know what? I, I Rob and I both work in retail stores and we still see that there are hundreds of people a day <laughs> going to retail stores. Um, picture that that isn't that way anymore but more so than that because of cloud's power um, you know, purchasing power whatever you want to call it there there aren't a ton of other jobs out there so getting a job for cloud is um, some people's like last chance at having a halfway decent living most of those jobs occur in these live work facilities um, which means that you you live on campus you can leave, but, you know, they're really kind of in the middle of nowhere. There are these giant, uh, I don't know, kind of giant like little towns in their own where, you know, all the shopping that you need is on site. All of the um, the medical care, or, uh, the entertainment, everything is at the location. So you clock into your, you know, whatever nine to five job there. You, you work in the warehouse or in security or in HR or management or whatever. And when you're done, you're you're basically, you know moments away from from all your shopping and all your home stuff now i know there's some campuses out there that are a lot like that now not necessarily that you live there but that also provide um you know entertainment and, and stores and stuff nearby there's a couple of major um companies that already do that but this is taking it all like to the next level yeah kind of in the way that uh i think i think the live work model is common in china and so right away you're looking at uh, it being kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for. The comparison is to uh, probably one of the most notoriously like poor working conditions. So like the book uh, is establishing this as kind of like a, a modern and efficient way of of running a business, but it's doing it in the model that you know in real life we all know is um, kind of like soul crushing and. Uh, n <laughs> never in the in the interest of of the workers like life it's more how can we just grind as much out of them as possible a uh, couple of notes about the cloud company in general like livius was mentioning how big the company is uh it, it's so big that it got to the point where it was influencing legislature like not um not like on a one-off basis, but very consistently. And then to the point where um, privatizing agencies of the government uh, because it could do it better. I'm doing, I'm holding up the quotes um, like the FAA uh, because of the whole uh, drone delivery stuff. They were influencing the FAA reg regulations so much that they just made an agreement with the government to privatize the FAA and run it basically. So like this company has an unprecedented level of influence over um, not just the economy, but like the entire like structure of government and law. Yeah, so that's the big setup for um, kind of what cloud is um, in the time frame that this story takes place. On a more local level, um, we're kind of introduced to how cloud works through uh, through the eyes of our two um, protagonists. So uh, Paxton. Um, is a former prison guard who turned entrepreneur and then lost his business um, to cloud, essentially. Um, he's now on his, you know, last leg and decides that he's going to try and get a job at cloud. The other uh, character, um, and this is mentioned in the synopsis, which I, I wasn't aware of um, when I was <laughs> reading the book, is uh, Zinnia. She is also getting a job at Cloud or trying to, and she's doing that because she's a corporate espionage um, expert, I guess, agent. So she's been hired by a mysterious voice on the phone to um, gather information on how Cloud produces its energy. 
So they take us through the interview process where like a bus drops all these people off in this small little um, almost ghost town in the, in the middle of nowhere. And what that process is, this is over like the first chapter or two. But it basically sets up the idea that if you get in, you're super, super excited. And if you don't, it's uh, I don't want to say necessarily life ending, but definitely it's uh, it's not the same reaction that that the average person gets to not getting a job. It, it's certainly more dire than that. If you can't get a job at cloud, you're basically screwed. So uh, just a note about the structure of the book. Um, it is written from like a third third person omniscient perspective. So we do see um, the different perspectives of the main characters like uh, Paxton and Zinnia. For the most part, I think, I don't know if we really dig too much into other people's perspectives, but not enough to be significant. Um, and there's also occasional um, kind of interludes, or I think Rob called them interstitials that he, he puts in, which are, uh, which are an email from the company or part of a manual or something like that. Uh, so formatting wise, you get the character perspectives, but you also get little cut-ins of you know, um, the orientation, uh, videos or something like that from the book. And, um, as Livius pointed out to me just now, silently, there's also <laughs> Gibson Wells, who is the, the leader of the, the guy that's in charge of cloud. He created cloud and he's the CEO. Um, you also have uh, a blog that he is writing. He has decided to write, um, as he travels the country, visiting these locations. And so there's, uh, his blog is kind of, spread throughout the book as well. So when you're not seeing the book from the perspective of Paxson or Zinnia, you're getting these blog posts from uh, Gibson Wells, or you're getting little um, videos, brochures, how-to guides and stuff like that, that are like the very corporate talky kind of official stuff, which is, I thought was a nice way to break up um, the drama of the regular story, but also to provide context for, um, like the perspective of cloud, which uh, I think me and Livius are going to agree, essentially is its own character in the book as well. So it definitely provides um, you with a way of seeing what the overall goal of cloud is as a company, which I thought it just it it broke things up nicely. Uh, so it wasn't just drama, drama. Yeah, and it did it in a way that um, felt very personal. So, you know, there are a couple of ways that we could introduce what, you know, what cloud is and what cloud does. Right. And that would be from, um, you know, side characters and interactions with people. And some of that occurs. But then the official voice is, as Rob said, the the video that, that plays in your room or on the on the train, whatever, the little like tram system that they have that gets, you know, workers from um, where they live to, to their stations and stuff. And there's videos playing and stuff. So it's a really nice and kind of personal in a authentic feeling way to, to get the company's um, view on things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very, very well done there. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit further than the uh, um, synopsis a little bit on the Gibson Walls character. So he is the cloud founder and CEO. These blogs that he's writing are written after he's been diagnosed with a terminal illness. So he's decided to communicate directly with the people through um, a series of blog posts, as Rob said, as he travels the country. So it's not... We get like cloud history from him. So he kind of takes us through like where the idea started and what kind of challenges he faced and, and why things are the way they are through the course of the story, which I think are, uh, again, lends an authenticity to the story that we'll talk about. Well, I'll talk about at least more, um, probably more in the wrap ups than I do like through the course of the story. Yeah. Um, so back to story a little bit. Uh, Livius mentioned that uh, at the beginning it was people were applying for the job and, and learning whether they got it or not. Uh, the people who did get it, which include uh, our Paxton and Zinnia characters, um, get shuttled from a weird kind of like warehouse area near the work life complex. Um, they had like it was like it was like an old theater, like an unused theater or something like that. I believe that they just mm -hmm. they, they filled out questionnaires on a tablet, and then based on their answers, they were chosen to work there or not. Um, so, <laughs> keeping that as far away from the actual like uh, uh, facility that they'd be working in as possible, I think is kind of funny and, and telling. 
Um, and then, yeah, so they get shuttled off to this place where they get processed, and, and it's all very um, modern and, and uh, well-managed. So uh, by the time they take the two-hour bus ride or whatever to get to the actual facility, um, the, like the computers and, and, and stuff have processed them into what job they were going to be doing, have you know decided where on the campus they're going to be living, and so as they get off the bus, they're handed these watches um, that they have to kind of authenticate to themselves. And once they're authenticated, uh, the watches just tell them what to do. They tell them what building to go to. They tell them what job they're going to have and, and stuff like that. So it's all very efficiently planned. And it's it's impressive at first sight to see how well organized the processing of uh, all these new hires is because you know two hours ago they weren't sure whether they were going to even be working at this company and by the time they get there they've got a room and they've got a, a job and a boss and all that kind of stuff yeah it's it's a ton of automation and i i know i say that and of course you know when we talk about a big warehouse company we're going to talk about automation but the whole process seems very very automated um with the exception of a little bit of like you know on the job training or whatever rob's right like everything is kind of dictated by a piece of software and an algorithm uh so much so that like your your cloud watch um you know gives you a warning when it's like time to get ready for work like you have to work in an hour you may want to start getting ready and head out for your commute to like that kind of thing um impressive and and really well done from rob hart's standpoint in that there there didn't seem to be a lot of seemed like he covered all the big Bases. Um, and he did it in a way with technology that, you know, is very, very near future. Um, so, for example, if you have a smartwatch, you know, that if you run like the Maps app on your smartwatch and you're doing walking directions, like it'll tap you when it's time to turn. Like the technology they used exists today, just maybe not quite at the level that it's used in the book. So uh, none of it is like really hard to imagine. Like I know like some of this is getting classified. I was looking at the Amazon listing and it's ranking somewhere in like the hard sci-fi and it's definitely not hard sci-fi. It's like two years from now, sci-fi, if that makes sense, like, like pretty much everything. And we talked a little bit about this with Rob, nearly everything in this book exists in some way or form. I mean, obviously we have drones. There's been talk about drone deliveries. We just don't have them where there are thousands of drones leaving a, a warehouse at the same time, but it's coming. So everything in here feels very authentic and very, very near future, which is kind of cool when you're, when you're reading the book. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that, um, early on and, and, and obviously we're not going to spoil anything. Like we don't spoil anything you know, and there's going to be a spoiler talk later on. So anything I say now shouldn't be too spoilery, but early on when, you know, they get their room assignments and it's immediately kind of understood that while it's, it's nice that they have a room to stay in, it's, it's not, anything glamorous like it's modern and it's clean but it's small and it's um i mean i got the feeling that it was very like ikea furniture like low quality mass produced kind of uh like it looks nicer in the catalog than like if you actually have to like sleep on on the mattress or whatever that kind of thing so um very much uh felt like a low quality small room be uh you know not not a ton of of personality to it so uh and and here's this this exemplifies one of the things i think rob did very well was he and and i know that when we talked to rob this came up a little bit about characters but i think it actually happens about the impressions about cloud in general um he does a good job of making it seem like it could be good could be bad like he toes a line a lot with, um, you know, like they're providing housing and obviously that housing is factored into like their salary, I'm guessing, and things like that. Um, so that's a positive, but it's not like, man, this is some great housing unless you want to pay a significant amount more like to have like the kind of place that you'd want to stay in. So um, those types of impressions happen like regularly throughout the book when it comes to a person interacting with cloud as a company so like you know when they're introduced to their work day you know there's it they talk about you know there's you, it's all calculated so that you know 
you can do what's reasonably to expect it, you know, what's, what could be reasonably expected of you in a work day. And then very soon after that, it's, it's becomes pretty obvious that you have to like basically work your ass off or things go poorly. So he does a really good job of, of presenting things as, you know, I could see why someone would think it's good, but I could also see why someone would think it's really not good. Yeah, and it's a balancing act that he does um, better, possibly than 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 most most books I've read. We talked a little bit about this if you listen to the interview. Um, he gives you kind of the the cloud view on things, and he gives you the 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 worker view on things. And a reasonable person could look at both and be like, "Yeah, yeah I kind of get, I get it." You, you know what I mean? Without trying to make it into, for me at least, into the big bad. You know, I. I, clearly, Cloud is um, maybe responsible. Like, how do I say this? It, you're kind of fucked if you don't work for Cloud. That's pretty much established that there is a subset of people in the country that this is their last hope. Um, that last hope was created by the fact that Cloud grew into this really, really big thing. It, you know what I mean? So it's like a, like a, I don't want to say self-fulfilling prophecy, but Cloud, you know, dist- Destroyed the competition, um, thereby creating um, a, an environment where, you know, they, they can um, kind of call the shots. Like, if you don't have other options, this is your only option. So that makes it, uh, that makes them have to be not as competitive, I guess, right? Like, when you're the only game in town, mm-hmm. like, the offer is the offer. Um, and, you know, so, but he does a very good job of balancing all that. Yeah, and I guess we should probably talk about the characters a little bit because it, it, it's so it's so fascinating to talk about the um, impact of of Cloud. But um, so you've got Paxton and Zinnia who are like the kind of main two. Paxton is um, Olivia's already kind of explained his story, and you can tell he's bitter that like this company took everything away from him by by basically crushing his small company um and the way that happened was he they did the whole this is a very walmart thing so um you know in order to sell with um cloud they ask you to price things in a certain way um and it basically narrows your margins of of profitability down to the point where like you can't sustain but if you don't sell with cloud you basically can't sustain either so um you know the choice is made do i sell through cloud and make you know and work at a (laughs) work at a work at a loss or do i just say screw you to them and then get run out of business altogether and that's kind of how he ended up where he is trying to get a job at cloud because it was really his only option but also super bitter and i got the feeling and and i don't remember how overt this was that he was joining to have an opportunity to stick it to the man in some way. Like he had, he fostered some sort of feeling inside of him that like, if I get this job, maybe I can, you know, give Gibson Wells the middle finger at some point. Yeah. I think his, his character kind of teeters a little bit. Um, so I, I, I definitely think there are parts where, where that was kind of his feeling, but on the other hand, like he just wanted to do the job that he had really well. So maybe we talk a little bit about his job, right? Because of his former prison guard experience, he's slotted into the one job he doesn't want, which is um, security. Um, so Cloud has its own, you know, for lack of a better term, police force that's run by an actual sheriff, like a like a, a badged sheriff um, <laughs> as the supervisor. But basically, they have security, and security is responsible for the things that policemen would be in a in a, in a regular town, right? So if there's a theft you know they have to find who's stealing and you know interrogate and then the arrest would be made you know by by the actual police um altercations that type of thing but the thing that paxton is tasked with um really up front is there and there's a drug problem at cloud there is a new drug um that a lot of people are using and what they're concerned about is how the drug is getting into a super secure facility so that's one of the things that he's tasked with and regardless of his feelings about cloud he definitely wants to do his job well. So he he's, takes it very, very seriously, um, which, again, makes him an interesting 
um, character in the fact that that he's kind of of two mindsets. He kind of hates Cloud, but when he's given a job by them, he wants to do really well at his job. Fucking company, man. So on the, <laughs> the other side, and I'm sure we're going to explore deeper both of these characters, but there's Zinnia, who um, is, is, a, is a spy, basically, and she infiltrates in order to get the information Livia's mentioned before. Uh, she is assigned to be one of the warehouse runners, which are basically like, you know, they get a order. They they get told where to go, what shelf to go to to take something, and what you know conveyor belt to put it on. So they're basically just drones, like not the kind of drones that are delivering stuff, but they are like drones, drone people. And it's interesting too that like the the way that the cloud culture, the company culture is built, it, um, you're measured. Uh, your your quality of work is measured by whatever you know metrics your job entails but you can see it um live um live updating on your on your watch so based on how quickly you take that thing from the shelf and put it on the conveyor belt um you you you're on, you got a rating between 1 and 5 and um the lower you are obviously the worse things are for you the higher you are the better um and it, it never and i think this was a good choice i think this was a good choice by rob hart um, you never got to know if there was some sort of rigging to the process or if it was an honest process. So like in my head, I was thinking, oh, I bet that they make it so that no matter how hard you work, you can't get above, you know, it's like, like an old, like pinball or not pinball, but like video game where like you could never get to like a certain level or whatever. Like I thought they might've had it rigged so that, um, you couldn't ever, get to like a comfortable kind of work rating, but he doesn't really tell you ever if that's the case or not. And I think that was a really wise choice. I agree. As far as the rest of the story goes, suffice it to say, we have one guy who's working security and one person who's a corporate spy. And of course they come across each other. And so unfolds the story of the warehouse. (laughs) <laughs> all right i don't know what else we could say about the plot i feel like we dove pretty deep into into cloud <laughs> um the the rest of the story is obviously you know there there are two there are two paths um kind of with the overview of cloud by gibson wells yeah that, that was just an abrupt we were like we had such in-depth stuff and then you're just like and that's yeah. the, that's the story i was like oh then we're gonna talk that's fine <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I feel like this book, I'm going to talk about a general like impression I have. Um, this book will, whether it's intended to or not, uh, spark a lot of conversation about um, these types of situations, this hypothetical that's thrown out. Um, but I don't I want to say that the the character um, the characters themselves, aren't kind of overshadowed by the message of the book. I feel like he did a good job of creating characters that you cared about um, and you cared what happened to them and stuff like that. It wasn't just, these are the things that get us through the story. I feel like he did, he, he created characters that were um, uh, characters you could get invested in. Absolutely. Um, You know, I kind of said it about Gibson Wells and, and I'll say it about Paxton and Zinnia, right? They're multifaceted. Um, in that, you know, I feel like sometimes I was completely with them. And then sometimes I was like, oh, huh, really? You know what I mean? Kind of went in a different direction. So much like real people, um, nobody is like the uh, the shining epitome of a hero in this book. They they come across as very real people with um, very real situations to deal with. And, and they don't always deal with them in the way that um, maybe as a reader, you, you want them to as somebody who cares about them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at the point where all the things I feel like are the right things to talk about next probably start to, you know, step over mm-hmm. the the spoiler line. So it might be a good time for us to just get them spoiler talks out of the way. Yeah, let's do it. Patreon.com slash booked. Um, spoiler talk is available to all contributors. Um, for as little as $1 a month, it's where Rob and I go to talk about the stuff we can't talk about here. 
uh, once you've read The Warehouse, which I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are going to read, uh, you'll want to go check out uh, what we had to say about the ending and some of the things we couldn't talk about here. We're back from a... I, I, I didn't clock it, but I think it's a, it's one of our more lengthy spoiler talks. There was a lot to talk about. We got off, off topic once or twice. Um, <laughs> we started off off topic and, and yeah. we steered back in, yeah. Um, but awesome stuff. So if you've read it, um, I think that you'll get a ton more insight onto our overall impressions and more of our passions about the story uh, if you jump back over there and listen to that. Um, the one thing I want to say, and I think we're pretty close to getting into wrap-ups here, um, I, I, there is, so, <laughs> the desire is strong to think that this company is Amazon um, when you're reading this, right? But there is one line, Did you? I don't know if you caught this line, there is a line, and this is 15% uh, into the book. A lot of people probably don't even remember. Back in the day, there was another company that did some of the same stuff we do now, except on a much smaller scale. Problem was their interests were too earthbound. I have to imagine that that company that he's referring to is Amazon. Oh, no, I didn't notice that. Yeah. I, re I remember the line, but I never thought about it. Yeah, because he does. It never comes up again. Because I actually, you know, highlighted that and said, "Okay, well, maybe later we'll find out about this other company." As like Gibson tells us more, mm -hmm. and it's never mentioned again. So I have to imagine that that's his uh, his disclaimer. <laughs> like when this ends up in court somewhere, he's like, "No, we're not talking about Amazon." As a matter of fact, there's a line fifteen percent in. That's where I'm talking about Amazon. Oh man, how great would it be if there was a court case about this? I would love that. That would be so cool. Um, I'm not sure Rob Hart would think that would just really yeah, cool. Yeah, it would be exciting, though. <laughs> <laughs> not that I want him to be sued. I'm going to put that on the record. I don't want Rob to be sued. I want to, one other thing. Did you notice that none of the actual workers at Cloud get a last name? Huh. I can't say for 100% certainty, but obviously Paxton and Zinnia definitely don't. I don't believe that Sheriff Dobbs does, or, and I guess he doesn't get a first name, maybe. But uh, so they're all single name characters. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And like I said, I, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain like all the, the CEO, like the CEO, obviously, we've talked about him, Gibson Wells and his daughters mentioned. And there's the guy who helped. Yeah, I would say helped him found, but he's like the, the vice CEO or whatever. He's the chief operating officer or something. He comes up, he gets the last name. I don't think anybody else does. I think it's just like the corporate bigwigs that get two names. That's interesting. I wonder if if there is anything behind that. Man, usually we interview the author after we re review the book. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we'll never know. So, never going to no. know. <laughs> why don't you, uh, if you have nothing else, why don't you kick off with your wrap-up? All right. Um, this, I'm going to start my wrap-up by saying that this book has been hyped forever. And, and so um, it first fell on our radar when Rob joined us to do the review of the president is missing with uh, the James Patterson and Bill Clinton book. He told us a little bit about, he told us, so there was hype before that. And he, he explained to us what was going on with the book about the movie and how it got bought and everything. So this thing has been hyped. Well, it was just like, it's over a year. It's gotta be close to two years or something like that. So we've been excited to read it for a long time. And the stuff that we've read from Rob in the past has always been um, good. Like he's a good writer. He knows how to write a story. He knows how to develop characters and create a narrative and stuff like that. Um, so I was expecting like, you know, some traditional Rob Hart stuff, but what we had read from him in the past was very much crime fiction. And so this is a departure from kind of the more like gritty, hard nosed stuff. This is more, um, I don't even know what to say. Like it, it's definitely more of a step towards straight literary, but even Rob acknowledges in our interview that there's like at least one tiny break into like speculative, speculative sci-fi at one point in the book. But like, like Livia says, this is all stuff that could happen today or next month or whatever. Cause it's, it's near future stuff. Um, so it's very grounded and it, and it, and it's different than the Rob Hart stuff that we had read in the past, but I think it's amazing. I think he did a great job of, um, like we have talked about both in our normal review and significantly more in spoiler talk, keeping things, uh, kind of walking a line with the way that the story is progressing, not only with, um, cloud as a company, but also with the characters and their allegiances and their intentions and everything like that. 
he did a great job of not making someone too much of one thing, which made the characters more interesting because you're wondering, you wonder more, what is their motivation? Why did they do that? Why are they choosing X, Y, Z? Um, and so it made the story just generally very compelling. Uh, it made you want to read more to figure out what was going on. And it did something that I think is very important to a successful story, which is it it made you make your own decisions about what was going on. And, and, it, and it pushed you into having an opinion about something, which is great because um, <laughs> a lot of the book criticizes people not, you know, doing enough to think for themselves kind of, but this book really puts it in your corner. Like here's what happened. It's up to you to decide how bad is this? How good is this? Um, it just created a really unique reading experience. And I, I just, I liked every bit of it. I, I think it was a great book. I think it's definitely the best stuff I've read from Rob Hart. And um, I think it's going to do a good job of creating a more constructive conversation because what happens in the world right now is it's me versus you and one of us is right. One of us is wrong. And this, I hope creates a conversation where it's like, wow, there's a problem. What can be done about it? And, and that's not very common right now. So I hope that was Rob's intention. If it wasn't, it's a wonderful accident. Either way, I think the book is awesome. Five stars. Really, through the course of this review and through spoiler talk, I've come to like two different ways to to think about this book. So one is um, for sure the way that Rob said. So it's current um, or what could become of current events in, in the near future. And, you know, there's there's nobody listening who hasn't, you know, heard about the impact that, you know, a company like Amazon, um, which, you know, clearly is the basis for cloud. Um, you know, could have uh, has currently and, and can and will have in the future if, if it remains unchecked. So um, it's a very timely piece um, that shows us one possible future for how things can go. The other way that that I've really started looking at this um, story is is through the writing. And Rob touched on this a little bit. So balance um, there. There are no clear um, white knights in this book. Um, there are no clear villains. It would have been super easy um, I've, I've never watched it, but is it Dr. Evil? Is that the guy from the, from those, um, weird, um, Michael Myers movies? Yes. Got, yeah. Okay. He could have certainly made Gibson Wells right into Dr. Evil and, and, and he chose not to, he chose to give, you know, what, you know, for Gibson's point of view is solid reasonings for the things he did and the things he's doing, um, which showed that, that other side. So Rob and I talked at length about balance, um, in spoiler talk to and how some of the things um, that come across as bad, there's an explanation for them. And Rob said, you can make your own decision. Um, I think, you know, other authors would have taken a, a different approach to this. We would have had the clear cut um, white hats and the clear cut black hats. And, and although ultimately nobody is going to take Cloud, the company, as the hero <laughs> in this book, as you can tell just from from the spoiler free talk that we gave you here, um, it does give you a, a, another look. And maybe it creates conversation. Um, but I think the way he went about it was was masterful. So it, it's a really good story written in a really, really great way. I'm with Rob on this five stars. Yeah. So it's funny because when I was saying that, like, hopefully this creates like a conversation of like, there's a problem. What's the solution? I said that because literally we had that conversation in spoiler talk and um uh, Livius, I don't know if the listeners can tell, but L Livius kind of leans one way politically and I kind of lean a different way. And usually we just fight about stuff. And, and I feel like we were more open to kind of, uh, just chatting, you know, it was, it, so I mm -hmm. feel like the book, I feel like that's what the book did for us. And if that's what it does for other people, that would be a very positive thing because at the end of the day, we all want very similar things. It's just, we have different ideas about how to get there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would love for that to be the impact of the book. For sure. And we're going to find out shortly because this book came out potentially today. If you're an <laughs> early listener, um, came out in the UK about a week ago um, from when you would be first hearing this. 
um, and it's out now in the U.S. So um, I, I think for various reasons, um, people should read this. One obviously is is the stuff that we talked about, right? Like the impact of of, of um, you know big corporations on our lives. But from the other thing, I think that it's a good book to read to really understand the mastery of walking the line. And I think that that's this book is going to be is going to come up in conversations that I have. I'm sure in the future when we read a book where somebody drops the ball on walking the line. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I just wonder how much of how much of it was intentional that he just created the atmosphere that he did. It had to be a focus. Um, I Listen, I like Rob Hart a lot. But if you listen to our interview, I'm thinking he had to work kind of hard at it. Yeah. No, then that's he's good. Not, there's no there's no middle ground. <laughs> On, on where he's at. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, if you and I were to come up with this book, we, we and, and again, we're nowhere near as talented as Rob Hart, but I'm saying having two opinions that can vary a little bit around capitalism or, or whatever could deliver us to where I go, hold on, man, we have to explain why this guy did that. You know what I mean? And you're saying, well, you know what? He's abusing these people this way. Collectively, maybe we could come up with something a little balanced. If he did it, I'm thinking he had to really work at it. Yeah. Well, and that's, uh, that's a testament to um, like, obviously there's a very personal motivation to why he wrote the story. But once he was in the story, it's obvious that he, he was more focused on telling the best story than he was telling his agenda. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for so. sure. And that's, and I know what that's I, when, when I said that, I meant that as the highest, the highest yeah. regard. He put in the effort to, to really put something together. That's, that's, um, operationally done beautifully yes i agree so uh yeah really excited about the the warehouse um i think it was i'm I'm glad i'm glad because like you get like so built up about something sometimes and then like if it's disappointing um it's like oh man but this was not the case no not at all (laughs) you can get this book on amazon (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what else you got, man? Uh, I got nothing else. I'm, I'm, I'm actually like this. Um, I feel like we put a lot of effort into this one. I feel a little, a little tired <laughs> right now. Did we drain you about this book? Not, not in a bad way, but yeah, it was a little draining. Um, I don't know, man. Like, so we've been so busy with uh, reviews and interviews lately that. Um, I haven't found myself a lot of free time. So when we ended up accidentally like two weeks ahead of schedule for like having read books and stuff like that, man, I, I just totally took advantage and I haven't read anything. I read the intro to the, the book that we're doing next. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I haven't read anything um, in at least a week, I think, and maybe more. And so that time has been taken up with, First and foremost, uh, from when we're recording this, it was um, two days ago, season two of Mindhunter released on Netflix, and I got off work a little early that day, um, and I spent the whole night watching the entire season straight through, <laughs> ten, 10 episodes that are like an hour each. <laughs> I um, I woke up on Saturday morning and, you know, did my morning routine and stuff, and then I, I pulled up the, the social media and Rob's post at like one thirty in the morning finished <laughs> finished that show, and I'm like, Jesus Christ! He must have gotten home from work and just watched him straight through. Is exactly what I thought. That's exactly what happened. I got home at like four p.m. and and it was just straight through. <sighs> um, yeah, and your review? I think it was great. So like, um, it in the so the, there's a trailer for you know, the season and I watched it and I was like, Oh wow. Um, they are really upping the ante with like all the crazy people that they interview and stuff. And I was surprised that the direction it took, but, um, overall I think it was really good because like the first season, if you think about it, they're establishing, you know, they're profiling and there's in their, the, um, like the processes and stuff that they're going to use in order to like figure out who like bad guys are. And, they could have just been like, all right, now we're just going to be nailing bad guys. And, and like, you know what I'm saying? Like just with the flip of a switch, mm-hmm. everything works. And I think the nice thing about this season without getting too, too into spoiling what happens is like, you get to see the frustrations of, well, now we have a method and we're applying it. 
and we expect it to work. But like, you know, when something doesn't work, like that can be really frustrating and stuff. So you get to see some of that. And I thought that was really cool. Um, I'll get to it because I like season one well enough. Yeah. Um, but some other things have popped up like Glow season three. Oh, man, I didn't even watch season two yet. Uh, yeah. Glow season three dropped, I I believe, Friday also. Um, I watched Dairy Girls season two. That might be of interest to maybe Thomas Joyce. I don't know if anybody else listening would even know what I'm talking about, but Dairy Girls season two hit Netflix, and uh, I watched all that yesterday. I've never even heard of it. It's um, about uh, it's about teenage girls in Ireland in the nineties. All right. I mean, if you it's, like it, yeah, it's like it's like eight twenty minute episodes. It's like watching one movie essentially, but it's gotcha. a it's a sitcom, and uh, it, it's it's actually. Um, it, it's more funny than it has any right to be in parts. The stuff you watch is so interesting. I'm very like predictable and, and mainstream and you just find these things. And I'm like, how does he even, mm-hmm. how does it happen? Yep. Yeah. Um, watched the first season of killing Eve as well after being pressured nonstop by, by multiple people. And I really like it. I really like it. It's all good stuff. I think um, everything friend, we talked about. So. Friend of the podcast called Killing Eve the Lesbian Hannibal. And my response was, You're the lesbian Hannibal. She thought it was a big compliment. <laughs> big compliment. <laughs> I don't know that I'd say that, but I will say that that Villanelle character is one of my favorite um, uh, antagonist characters. Sure. Um, just goes up there on the list with like um, Alice from Luther and uh, like Al Swearingen. From yeah. um, oh yeah, yeah you know uh, goddamn I can't think what it's called Deadwood you know what I'm talking about Deadwood yeah <laughs> like there are just some characters they're just iconic and they're they're iconic you know bad guys um, you yeah. know for for lack of a better term and and the villanelle character is definitely definitely up there for me. What do you think about would you lump Moriarty from the Sherlock series in there? Um, or is he too like styled stylistic? Yeah, I, I think that's the problem is that he's not. How do I say this? The rest of them, I, I feel, are like kind of quirky, um, almost accidentally. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think he, I, I although I really like him as a character. Um, yeah, I think that might have been a little a little forced. Real leans really hard on the. Yeah. Being I mean, I liked him as a character. I love that series. I just don't, don't know that he jumps to the to yeah. mind when I think of like really wonderful, relatable villains. Yeah, it's the relatability that's the problem. Um, so what's on the what's on the horizon for for the podcast? Oh, this one is so good. So I want to. <laughs> this is not a judgment on the next book we're going to review, but I want you and and listeners to to understand where I'm coming from. You just heard our review of the warehouse. It's a big, big book to read. Not big like pay, high page count, but you know, I mean, it's it's a, a big theme book to read. Um, immediately after reading that, I took, uh, I took the opportunity to read the angels game by Carlos Ruiz Zafone. I know I mentioned it, I think in the last podcast, um, but it is the, the up to, um, the shadow of the wind, which Rob tried to get me for, to read for years. And I did recently and absolutely fell in love with it. It's one of my all time favorite books. So I read the follow up to that beautifully, beautifully written, great story, terrific, and then I had to open up the next book that we're reviewing. <laughs> and I am now reading pizza themed horror short stories. Yeah. yeah this you is are. not a judgment on the book, but you want to talk about taking a 180 from from the kind of stuff I, I, I read most recently. This is completely in the other direction. Tales from the Crust, an anthology of pizza horror, which was uh, edited and put together by David James Keaton and Max Booth the Third is going to be our uh, our next review. I'm uh, I'm 3 stories in and it's exactly what I expected. <laughs> I read the introduction so far, um which is a I'm, all I'm going to say is that it's a classically David James Keaton introduction. Um and uh, I think yeah, my laziest laziness needs to curtail so that I can get it done on time. Um but I'm looking forward to it. Keaton always brings something crazy, so um that'll be good. Yeah, speaking of which, our next episode is going to be up uh, just a couple days late, as Rob has some obligations. 
um, over the next week, um, which I'm sure he's still going to get the book read early, way before we review it. But recording might be a little late next week. <laughs> yep. So thanks for bearing with us for that. Uh, I, that's all I got, dude. That's, that's yeah. um, I think that might be enough. Yeah. So um, thanks for listening. If uh, you liked what you heard, definitely go back one episode. If you haven't already listened to the interview with Rob Hart, where we talk a lot about his motivations um, for writing the book, some of the processes behind uh, the story that you heard about, and then a bunch of other cool Rob Hart stuff. Uh, next time, Tales from the Crust Anthology Pizza Horror with perhaps with perhaps a special guest on that episode. I'm not gonna I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, it's gonna be somebody who's Papa been on the John. Podcast Is it before. Papa John? <laughs> We're gonna get Papa John. Can we even have Papa John on? He's like a racist now, right? Like, oh yeah, we don't we'll, want. Like, we'll yeah, get, yeah, we'll lose we sponsors. Oh wait, we don't have sponsors. We still don't want the racist. To be clear, we still don't want the racist on. All right. So instead, <laughs> we might have someone who is not Papa John on. <laughs> the guy in the little Caesar's costume, the pizza pizza guy. Oh, I would love to have that guy on. Yeah, yeah, oh, it would be God. kind of weird because it'd just be him saying pizza pizza throughout the podcast but you know what? no because there was i'm gonna go into this now so there was a little caesar's like a series of commercials like in the 90s where like like random shit would happen it was really it's, it was one of those ad campaigns where they were just like well fuck it we're just gonna do whatever and that little guy would like um it, like the weirdest thing like his dog would come back and he thought his dog was gone forever and the little pizza guy would be like scruffy you're alive like things like that out of nowhere it was so strange oh, um it was a little weird uh or like there was one where he's like i have a brother it, it, just random like surprising elements like he thought he lost his wallet and he found it and he's like my wallet so yeah commercials from back then were really troubling somebody um that i work with i had agreed to join um a, a football draft uh, a football um shit fantasy football yeah, league yeah and so I go, all right, well, I'll sign up for it. And then I realized he had to have a Yahoo account. So I, I messaged this person back. I was like, I, I, I need a Yahoo account. This is like 1994 or whatever. So I sent them like one of those really early <laughs> Yahoo commercials, but I had to watch it. Yeah. I got to tell you that the 90s was a really weird time for commercials. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a YouTube channel dedicated to like weird. Well, there TV, was that, you know, weird quiz nose like taxidermied like dead rat kind oh, of thing or whatever. yeah that thing had to be the thing that put them out of business right the roadkill <laughs> yeah, that, that was advertising their sandwiches it was fucking horrifying yeah it was really weird yeah i anyway, agree i agree <laughs> um so tune in next week to see if it's papa john the little caesar's spokesperson <laughs> or somebody else on not, the episode definitely not the quiz nose rat though no no because that thing was run over by a car yeah, exactly until then, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. Pizza, pizza. Yeah, dude, those are the weirdest fucking commercials. <laughs> <laughs>